Okay. Um, so, right. So the point of today is a big, broad overview of the immune system and a little bit more detail than we did last week. So we're just trying to build, um, but still not at the point of trying to memorize anything or really even come to any deep level of understanding. The important part is just getting through the, um, the reading without bogging yourself down. So don't feel the need to go back and reread a paragraph after paragraph to develop a deep understanding. Really what I want you to do when you're reading is to see the words for the first time, to start to build a big picture, or even just start to understand that signaling in the immune system is complex. And if that is it the first time through, um, it's no big deal, that is totally fine. Um, and then I'm hoping to repeat it. And, and when I repeat everything in each chapter, hopefully it will start to make a little bit more sense. So now when we start going through a bus and looking at each of these things in more detail, you'll start to understand it a bit more and you'll start to understand the points that you're really just gonna need to sit down and memorize at some point in order to um, pass your boards. Okay, but here we go. Um, I put in um, some practice questions, some pre-post questions. Uh, Megan, these should start to look pretty familiar to you, um, but I'll just run through them quickly and then we'll go over them together at the end. Um, what DNA segments are the first to rearrange in adaptive immune cells? Question two, which antibody is the best at fixing complement? Question three, what molecule causes the release of the clip or invariant chain in MHC class two presentation? Question four, name the components of the T-cell receptor complex. Question five, name the components of a T-cell co-stimulator. Uh, question six, name two down-regulating cytokines. So these are just really broad, broad um, questions. Um, and just a little bit of the type of detail that board's questions are written on. These are not example board questions, of course, but just the, um, the idea of the type of things that may come up. Usually when something is um, pulled as an immunology question, it's because there's some clinical relevance there, like a, a, a form of the gene for that protein and um, has been found to have a variant that may lead to an immune deficiency. Okay, um, so remember before we, we started with the broad concept of the immune system and then you have the adaptive immune system and the innate immune system. The innate immune system is innate. You're born with it, nothing changes. The adaptive immune system, all the components of the adaptive immune system have adapted or changed some way before they're functioning. So the first part of this text reviews the innate immune system of which complement is one of the absolute earliest known um, proteins uh, that are found in um, even very unsophisticated organisms um, as a means of defense. So the complement's very easy to get overwhelmed with, but really the important part you need to know are these two facts that I have right here. One, uh, that it's just a system of proteins that work together to kill pathogens in a cascade. So there's different proteins that activate, activate, activate until they eventually just punch holes in the side of pathogens and that kills them. And there are three different ways that this complement system can get activated. Um, one is called the alternative, one's called the classical pathway, and the third is called the lectin pathway. Okay. So the alternative pathway is um, usually the easiest to understand because it starts with C3, which is just spontaneously cleaved. And it's cleaved into two um, components, which we call C3B and C3A. And the C3B binds to an amino hydroxyl group, these um, carbohydrates. But if it's not, if it can't bind, it's neutralized by water very, very quickly in under a second. Um, so you have this continuous spontaneously cleaved C3, but if there's not the right target for it to bind to, it's neutralized very quickly. And that's why we're not overwhelmed in a normal state with complement. 
So remember, this is a cascade. C3B will then bind to something called protein B, and then protein um, D comes along and clips B. So you get this C3B, BB. I know that's a mouthful. Don't get too upset about it. Just remember, you've had C3. It gets cleaved. It binds to protein B. It gets cleaved. And then um, this complex, the C3B, BB, can cleave a whole bunch of C3 into C3B or C5 into C5B to get this cascade going. And then once the C5B is created, it will um, assemble with the C6, C7, C8, C9. So we've seen most of the complement system in just this one pathway. And that is the, um, the MAC, the membrane attack complex that each one of these, so you can have one form on the cell, it'll probably be fine. This is one small pore, but this pores, once it is um, many, many, many are on the outside of the cell, the cell will die because of the osmotic gradient that is created there. Um, there are two um, proteins that you should be aware of because these are associated with disease. So remember, whenever we see something that in some um, variant form uh, can cause disease, it's probably something that you should um, start to put on note cards and start to think about um, for the board. So there's decay accelerating factor or DAF that's found in human cells and it accelerates the destruction of C3B, BB. Of course, this, this is a, just a point to try and um, prevent um, complement from going unchecked and, and targeting cells that shouldn't be targeting, namely human cells. Protectin or CD3, CD59, um, it's another human cell surface protein and it stops these MACs. Um, same thing, you just, you don't want this complement attacking yourself. You don't want an autoimmune form of complement. What you want is it to stop if it's on human cells, you want this to be destroying um, pathogens only. So DEF and CD59 uh, is associated with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. PNH. Um, so something to, again, don't need to memorize now, but just start to remember that if there is a pathogenic form, um, if there is a variant form that can lead to a disease, that is just one little part of the system that you should, it's probably a good signal to know. It means it's a higher likelihood to be on, um, be tested. Okay, lectin pathway. Lectin is a protein that can bind to a carbohydrate. It's just the definition of what a lectin is. An example of a lectin is mannose binding lectin. Mannose is a carbohydrate, and it's a carbohydrate that's specifically formed, uh, that's found on pathogens. Um, so a mannose binding lectin um, is a lectin that binds to mannose. So the MBL um, will then bind to mass which is a mannose binding lectin associated serine protease. And then mass will clip C3 into that C3B and start that um, complement cascade all over again, just like we learned the first time. It's just starting in a different way. So there is a clinical mannose binding lectin deficiency in the United States. We don't have any approved products to treat this. Um, but I believe in Europe, they do. Um, it's something that we occasionally um, test for and um, children have increased infections. So again, associated with disease, good to know. Um, some other functions of complement, um, C3B uh, can be turned into IC3B, which opsonizes pathogens for phagocytosis. So it's not continuing that complement cascade um, like C3B does, but once it is an activated, it's in this activated form, it can still serve a function by opsonizing those pathogens or coating it all over the place and just making it <clears throat> a, a more uh, visible to the immune system. Uh, so that it can be um, targeted by other means. In addition, remember when um, I said C3 is complement uh, is initially cleaved, it can go to C3A or C3B. Um, same with C5. Well, that A is not just discarded 
um, they can actually attract neutrophils and macrophages to the site of infection. So um, they still have a point. So if you're starting to cleave a lot of, if that cascade's going, you're starting to cleave lots of C3 and C5, that's a signal for neutrophils and macrophages to move to the site of infection because um, the complement system is eventually going to run out of steam and need our more sophisticated um, innate immune uh, defense to kick in. Okay, moving right along, away from complement to phagocytes. So phagocytes are cells that eat. These are the main cells that um, target pathogens that get into our bodies. Macrophages is an example. Um, like I mentioned last week, they're a sentinel in the skin um, and other barrier tissues. Um, they're just sitting, waiting in a resting state most of the time until it sees a pathogen. And it's a resting state. It expresses a few of those class two MHCs, those molecules that are on the outside of cells that present a pathogen. Um, but they get activated by something called interferon gamma that's secreted from both T helper cells and NK cells. What this does is when the macrophage sees that interferon gamma, it upregulates MHC2, and then they want to engulf. They start to eat um, what's around them. They are hyperactivated directly by what it, whatever invader is around. Um, for example, in a gram-negative um, bacteria, there's something called LPS, and if it senses that LPS, um, it can get hyperactivated. And then when they're doing this, it secretes uh, TNF, which can send signals to the rest of the immune system. Another very important phagocyte, because like I mentioned last week, macrophages are eventually going to get used up and overwhelmed with the infection. So this is where neutrophils come in. Neutrophils are another phagocyte. They're short-lived. They can also produce TNF to continue inflammation, that inflammatory response. Um, neutrophils dive in, they um, eat, they die, they become pus. Of course, they're more sophisticated than that, which I think he actually mentions in the book, but um, in the very easiest form, that's neutrophils' role. But remember, what has become very important for clinical disease is just understanding how all these cells are getting to the site of infection. So this is where rolling and adhesion comes in. And we're going to learn a lot more about this concept um, later on. But there are something called uh, integrin ligands on the surface of um, your vessels. Um, an example is ICAM. And then there is a selectin ligand on neutrophils. And this gets very confusing, in my opinion. And I can't remember it off the top of my head. I have to look back every single time um, whether the integrin is on the vessel or on the cell, or if the selectin is on the, uh, on the vessel or the cell and which one the ligand. So if a selectin ligand is on the neutrophil, that means the selectin is on the vessel. If integrin ligand is on the vessel, that means the integrin is actually on um, the cell. So once um, you start to get this TNF, that's this markers of inflammation or any other um, cytokines, TNF, IL-1, They'll cause the endothelium of the blood vessel in that area. So say you've got a splinter on your finger, um, the macrophages are going to start their job, but they're going to secrete TNF. And when it secretes TNF, this is going to cause the endothelium to locally express selectin. And then other signals that are go, starting to go into the bloodstream, like the C5A, um, are going to cause the neutrophil to start expressing um, integrin. And what's going to happen is then the integrin ligand is going to, or um, sorry, um, the selectin ligand is going to bind to the selectin and it's going to slowly cause these cells to start um, slowing down. So as they slow down, the integrins will kick in and they will actually cause it to stop. So they slow, stop, and then they can squeeze through two um, cells of the vessel wall and they get to the site of infection that way. This is how neutrophils, which we know are in the bloodstream because we can see them in a blood count that we do um, uh, just routinely, a CBC. And we need to get to the site of infection and this is how they do it. Um, 
They can also exit through different signals. So anything, and this is um, a newer concept. I don't think we talked about this at all last week, but throughout this, the, uh, this book and the next book, we talk about how things um, know how to get places. And there's a special set of uh, cytokines called chemokines. And chemokines um, will help direct um, cells where to go. So in this example, um, TNF is acting like a chemokine because it is it's telling a cell here, here's where you need to stop, here's where you need to go. So there is a constant series of upregulation and downregulation of the receptors on the cells, depending on where it needs to be and what it needs to do. Um, and chemokines are then going to help direct it to where it needs to go. Okay. There are also things that um, your cells can kind of um, sniff out and find infections. So these, for example, are something called FMET. This is a unique to bacteria. There's also the C5A that's getting released by the complement system that can help um, guide these phagocytes where to go. Okay, moving right along. NK cells are another part of the innate immune system. They're a lymphocyte, but the DNA of these type of lymphocytes do not rearrange, so it's an innate cell. It's part of the innate immune system. They mature in the bone marrow, and they proliferate by IL-12, and very specifically IL-15. And I, and I bring that up because IL-15 um, cannot signal um, when you have a, when you're born with a common gamma chain defect. Um, which is a form of skid. I don't want to confuse you too much, Zoe, but when you start talking about skid for your PEDS spores, you'll see T negative, B negative, and T negative, B positive potentially. For um, the allergy boards, you're more likely to see T negative, B negative, NK negative, or T negative, B positive, NK positive. Uh, if you don't have your common gamma chain, the most common um, X-linked form of skid, you don't have T cells, and you don't have NK cells. And the reason is you can't signal through, um, IL-15 can't signal, and IL-15 is essential for NK cells. Okay, that was a huge aside. Um, but NK cells can be activated by interferon, IL-12, or LPS, and they release the inflammatory cytokines, interferon, and IL-2. So there's a whole lot of feedback you're gonna notice in the Indian system. Um, when inflammation starts, that cytokines are going to release to cells, cells will get activated and release more of that cytokine to increase um, the inflammatory response. Okay, NK cells destroy cells by initiating apoptosis, for example, a tumor cell or a virally infected cell. It will um, it will bind to the cell and there is a series of activating receptors and inhibitory receptors. And depending on the signals that it receives and gives, it will start programming that cell um, to die by apoptosis. Okay. I'm gonna take um, a break for a second and ask if you have any questions about all that. Innate immune system in five minutes for less. No problem. Okay, I'm going to move on. Adaptive immunity. Okay, so B cells and T cells are lymphocytes, and they are the two lymphocytes that adapt. So they're part of the adaptive immune system. And what I mean by adapt is that they rearrange their DNA. And the reason for this is in our very sophisticated human bodies, we need to be able to identify um, millions, if not trillions of different pathogens. And we need to um, be able to do it in a way um, that we can take all those millions of pathogens we can encounter and distinguish them from either one bacteria that is not going to be harmful to us and we want to ignore, or even our own cells. We want to be able to easily distinguish from pathogens. So what happens is B and T cells, we don't have enough DNA in our body to encode all the different cell receptors that would be needed to recognize all those millions of potential pathogens out there. 
So in order to gain that diversity, to get all those different T and B cell receptors or our repertoire of receptors, what your DNA has to do is it has to start rearranging and it starts rearranging in a very imperfect way. Um, and I say imperfect because there's a lot of um, kind of mistakes and accidents and mutations that can happen in this process that increases the diversity even more that, and may or may not end up being a mistake. Um, so that's what makes adaptive immune system adaptive, but it also ends up having memory. So when all the work has been done to rearrange the receptor, it sees a pathogen, it successfully beats a pathogen, it doesn't, all that rearranging doesn't just die off at that point. That's where there's memory. So this is how, you know, we exploit with vaccines. We use the adaptive immune system um, to try and poise some B and T cells ready for when we actually see a pathogen um, instead of uh, having a B and T cells try to fight it um, naively without any um, prior programming. Okay, so B cells, of course, um, are one of these lymphocytes. Um, remember, this is the humoral immune system when we're talking about B cells, the humors, the good humors of the antibodies. B cells are made in the bone marrow um, and they have a B cell receptor. It's how we know a B cell is a B cell. We actually just look at, ask a flow cytometer to look to see if there's a B cell receptor. A B cell receptor is actually just an IgM antibody that is bound to the surface of the B cell. Um, it looks uh, like this figure here on the right, as do all antibodies. Um, it's just this particular one um, is has this, um, this uh, surface binding um, region. So it will stay on a B cell and not be secreted. It's made of heavy chains and light chains. Each part of these undergoes some um, gene rearrangement. So there is um, a rearrangement order in which the DJ region will rearrange first and then um, the V rearranges. So if you look at this antigen uh, binding site here, on the ends, there's two of them for each antibodies. And there is this variable region on the heavy chain, and there's also a variable region on the light chain. But then there's another D region and a J region. Um, on the light chain, it's V and J. So on this heavy chain, the D and J will rearrange first, and then the V comes on, and you have a VDG rearrangement. I remember that by remembering DJs came be before video jockeys, disc jockeys came before video jockeys. Uh, but this seems to be a um, a nugget of information that comes up for no ex explainable reason. Um, I don't think it's associated with any sort of um, immune deficiency, but. Um, it's one that comes up from time to time. Okay, so um, a B cell re receptor, a naive B cell is a B cell that is fully formed. It has a full B cell receptor on the outside. That B cell receptor, we can see it with a flow cytometer um, when we ask a flow cytometer to look for it. But it is a naive B cell if it has not yet been activated by an antigen. Um, so an antibody will bind to the antigen epitope. Um, what that means is up here in these antigen binding regions, you have your pathogen and it will bind to a B cell um, that it recognizes. This is very, very, very specific, which B cell. So there'll be lots of B cells that may bounce off a particular pathogen over and over until one finally connects and it hits. That's why that BDG uh, J re rearrangement has to happen. It has to happen. Um, so you have lots of diversity. So eventually one will be able to recognize that pathogen and bind to it. Um, as you can see though, here you have your IgM and here you have your binding region to the membrane, but there's not a lot of tail here on the outside to do anything. So your B cell receptors are, um, um, are, they rely on 
um, Ig alpha and Ig beta for signaling. So these are other signaling proteins. So you can bind here, but this will actually um, these uh, Ig alpha and Ig beta molecules will actually have the tail on the inside here with ITAMs. That's just a little area that's kind of a pro um, uh, area that will start the signal. This is where it actually has a tail into the cell membrane where it can then start another cascade of proteins down to the nucleus to tell it to, okay, start the transcription and the translation and making more protein, whatever protein I'm telling you, whether it's a cytokine protein, make TNF at this point, um, or uh, start making more immunoglobulin at this point because that's what I want you to do. So the adaptive immune system, a lot of what we're gonna learn about is how these receptors work, where the pathogen binds to, and then what actually starts the signaling. You can get overwhelmed really easily with some of these signaling cascades, but just like complement, really step back and just kind of remember, it's just a series of proteins that just activate, 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 activate all the way down to the nucleus in this case. Okay, so signaling, it requires um, either cross-linking, meaning um, you can't just have one little part of that pathogen bind here. Um, it's a redundancy that's built into the immune system so B cells don't start activating out of control. You need a checks and balance all the time. So of the checks and what are the checks and balances? One is something called this cross-linking. So if you have um, a pathogen, you may have a whole bunch of similar carbohydrates on the outside, one, two, three, four, five. And each one of those, the antigen, that little epitope, on that pathogen will bind to one B cell receptor and then another and another and another and another. So if you have lots of B cell receptors that are binding, then that's just this cross, this, you know, this double check system that yes, okay, it looks like we should get, um, it's not a mistake, it looks like we actually should be activated. Or you can get a second signal from a co-receptor. In a B cell case, the co-receptor is something called CD21. So when we are um, actually looking at flow cytometry, the second signal will be next to the B cell receptor. So you still have this Ig alpha, Ig beta. This is the part of the B cell receptor that sends the signal down, but you definitely you have this other second signal called the CD21, which if you don't, in the absence of cross-linking, it is another way of a checks and balances. You're looking for a B cell receptor to get activated. You're also looking for this CD21 to get activated to actually start this cascade. Uh, actual activation um, not only takes this co-receptor, however, where you're going to have the second binding site, you need a co-stimulatory signal. And the co-stimulatory signal for B cell is CD40, CD40 ligand interaction, which has a lot of clinical relevance don't memorize it today, but as you go on, we're going to hear more about CD40, CD40 ligand, because in the absence of these, you can develop hyper IgM syndrome or the absence of functioning CD40, CD40 ligand. A B cell can also be activated by mitogens. So mitogens are uh, chemicals that are found just in plants in the world, like a pokeweed mitogen, that there's just a plant called a pokeweed. We can take one chemical from it, this mitogen. A mitogen is a chemical that will force a cell into mitosis. It force, forces a cell to start splitting. So in a B cell receptor independent manner, you can also get a B cell to activate and start dividing by just putting it in a Petri dish with mitogen. And we exploit that when we are diagnosing um, immune deficiency. Okay, but there's one other very important thing that we need to remember about um, B cells. They uniquely secrete antibody instead of cytokines as their mechanism of action. So remember that very first antibody is actually just IgM. IgM is what the B cell receptor is, and then when you're ready, it can start secreting IgM as well. IgM is not very good though, it's okay. It's a huge molecule. It's actually a pentamer of five different IgMs that are all connected together. Its half-life is about a day. 
um, and it can fix complement in the classical pathway, which we did not talk about yet. Um, <laughs> to get better antibody, though, you have to be able to class switch. So you've already had this BDG, BDJ rearrangement. So then you need to have this um, uh, the C region also rearrange to class switch from CM to G, E, or A. And what that re final rearrangement will allow you to do is to switch the IgM to maintain the antibody region of the, of the um, antibody, but just the function of the antibody. So it can change it from IgM to an IgG that still recognizes the same pathogen, or it can be an IgE, or it can be an IgA. Okay, IgG is by far the most important antibody to us. It's why when you have an immune deficiency, it's the only one that we actually end up replacing. You can survive just fine, even if you have little to no IgA or IgM, but you have to have to have IgG. So we replace IgG in either IVIG or sub-Q IgG. IgG can fix complement, and there are IgG subtypes that you need to know. We don't usually check them clinically. Some immunologists still do. I think the data isn't great that it is that helpful. Um, but the different subtypes of IgG will fix complement uh, more robustly than others. And the order, conveniently for everyone who lives in Chicago, is 312. So the way I remember this is the area code of Chicago, of course, is 312. So hopefully no one in Chicago will get the question wrong that asks what order uh, Affinity uh, IgG will fix complement. It's 312. So IgG will all also opsonize the outside of a pathogen, um, which means it binds a whole bunch of them and it just kind of decorates it and gets it ready um, to be taken care of by a different part of the immune system. It also plays a role in something we'll talk more about later when we get into a BAS, this antibody um, dependent ADCC. It's just another mechanism of which we can clear infection. IgG uniquely crosses the placenta, which every pediatrician knows, the internists never do. But of course, what do we do if we see an infant and we check IgG? <coughs> um, it's not helpful. Um, it may not be very helpful for several months uh, because that IgG is very possibly mom's and we can't distinguish baby's IgG from mom's IgG with our level of sophistication and testing as it stands today. What can we do? Well, we can check IgG in one day in a newborn. IgG's half-life is three weeks. It's three to four weeks. That's why we um, dose IVIG once a month. We dose the medicine every half-life. So we're dosing at IgG every three to four weeks. Um, so it's decaying. So if mom gives a bolus of IgG to baby, it crosses the placenta, excuse me, then it should start decreasing over the next five to six half-lives, which is five to six months. And if we see a baby who has an undiagnosed um, uh, skid, which hopefully does not happen anymore now that we have newborn screen, but back when I started training, this is how you'd see them. At five to six months of life, they got really, really sick because they just had no IgG left. Most of the time that's caught with the newborn screen now, so we see them right away. If we are curious and we're doing immune workup and an infant, if their IgG is theirs, the way we can look is we can look one week and then we can check again another week. And if the IgG goes up, well, baby has made some IgG, so that's a good sign because mom's levels never can go up once it's in baby. It's only going to go down. Okay, so if a B cell, it starts as IgM. If that B cell um, is in the presence of interferon gamma, it will class switch to IgG. IgA is our actual most abundant antibody. It guards our mucosal surfaces. This is a dimer. So in um, our body's IgA actually is two IgAs hooked together by a clip, a dimer. And it will facilitate, uh, the dimer 
the clip will actually facilitate the transport across um, the wall of our GI tracts, and it makes IgA resistant to GI enzyme breakdown. It's also secreted in breast milk, and if a B cell that is secreting IgM is exposed to TGF beta, it switches to IgA. So these are these chemokines are just ways the immune system can be very specific and direct how it wants um, the immune system to start working. Oops. Of course, IgE causes mast cell degranulation, which is our primary defense against helminthic parasites. But um, when something is going wrong, it causes allergies um, and it will class switch when it is in the presence of IL-4 or IL-5 cytokines. Okay, so special concepts for B cells. B cells, once they are activated, once they see that pathogen, they're no longer naive, they see a pathogen, they're working, they will do something um, called somatic hypermutation. What this is, is a bunch of different mutations that occur in the rearranged antibody um, that may or may increase or decrease affinity for that pathogen that it's seen. And then what happens is there's a system of checks and balances that if the infinity is increased, that new B cell is gonna be favored and it will make clones of itself of which some undergo hypermutation, of which some will have even higher affinity. So the higher affinity ones will be selected, the ones with lower affinity start dying off, they're not useful. So um, you can get a B cell activated when it recognizes a pathogen, sort of, but then you get this somatic hypermutation that starts to make it very, very, very specific for a particular um, pathogen. Um, after this happens and you have this very specific um, B cell, the fight is over, the pathogen is cleared, doesn't um, go away. It turns into a memory B cell. So you end up having next time when you get a pathogen, um, it will uh, start, it, it can activate, it can recognize what it needs to do very quickly. You may not even sense that you have a, a a virus or bacteria in you because you may clear it so quickly because of this memory. Uh, of course, as things undergo, I uh, skipped over this, but as it, the base cells undergo somatic hypermutation, they become plasma cells where they just start secreting. Uh, they go back to the bone marrow and they start secreting different antibodies, whatever antibodies needed in a large amount um, during, uh, during the infection. Okay, um, antigen presentation. This is a little bit out of order, but okay. So before we move on to T cells, which is the final cell of the adaptive immune system, let's talk about antigen pre presentation. How does this happen? How does the immune system get kicked off to begin with? Well, there are two molecules that you really need to know, class one MHC and class two MHC. You've probably heard about this in your basic um, biology class in college. Um, class one MHC is found on all nucleated cells. Um, it has um, two components. It has this alpha chain, and then it has a beta two microglobulin um, associated with it. There are three types. There are HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C. And it has a closed groove um, where the antigen will actually sit. The antigen has to be about eight to 11 amino acids long to be able to sit in this closed groove. So what class one MHC does, it presents endogenous proteins. So these are proteins inside the cell that can be cut and processed into that very small eight to 11 amino acid length in order to fit into that, um, that groove. So the protein is cut up in the, your cells by something called proteasomes. And then they're carried um, across the endop uh, endoplasmic reticulum by something called HAP. Uh, and there is immune deficiency associated with a whole bunch of these molecules. So this is uh, a point not today um, and not this year for you, Zoe, but Megan, game on for you. 
time to start remembering some of these molecules like cap when there's an associated immune deficiency with it. So um, the protein's cut up in the proteasome. It's carried across the endoplasmic reticulum by TAP, and then it's loaded into that class one MHC, then transported to the cell surface. Um, in antigen-presenting cells, uh, there are proteins LMP2, LMP7, and MECL1 that increases the amount of proteins that are suitable for presentation. It's all just um, part of the processing. Class two MHC, um, do I have a picture here? No, I don't, okay. Has an open binding groove instead of that closed binding groove. So this, the protein that goes in it, the antigen that goes in it can be much longer and less perfectly processed. It can be anywhere from 13 to 25 amino acids in length. HLA, um, sorry, the class two MHC are HLA-DP, HLA-DQ, and HLA-DR. These are only on antigen presenting cells because in general, antigens are presented by class two MHC. So MHC class two will display exogenous proteins, proteins from outside the cell. It's made of an alpha chain and beta chain instead of an alpha chain and a beta two microglobulin. It's actually two chains it initially binds to the invariant chain to prevent the protein from binding until it hits the cytoplasm. So uh, the if you remember in MHC class one, the protein was loaded and then that was transported. Well, here you have your alpha and beta chain assembled. You have MHC class two. You don't want any of your endogenous proteins to accidentally fill into that, um, that groove, however. So there's something called the invariant chain that goes into there and it prevents any protein and binding until it's in the cytoplasm where it's going to actually be able to see those exogenous proteins. And then there's something called HLA-DM that causes the release of this invariant chain, which has been processed into the clip. Uh, HLA-DM, do not mistake it for a class two MHC itself. That's DP, DQ, DR. The HLA-DM is part of the class two system, but it just is a molecule that releases that clip. It's not one of the class two molecules itself. I find that very, very confusing, um, but something to try and keep in mind. Okay, so what are the an antigen presenting cells? Antigen presenting cells are macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. So they require both the MHC with the protein load into it to bind to the um, T cell receptor in a co-stimulation by B7 CD28. So, well, okay, so I guess we're not there yet. We're, we're going to get to T cells yet, I promise. Um, dendritic cells are another sentinel, just like those macrophages. They're in the periphery. They are the ones that initiate the immune response. They really are very responsible for setting that first initial kind of uh, inflammatory milieu that will start telling the different cells and communicating to the immune system <clears throat> what direction the immune system should go or should skew. Should it go towards what it needs to fight a helminthic parasite or should it go towards what it needs to fight staph? So the dendritic cells are gonna give those first initial signals. It's gonna be the first cell that eats up the bacteria or the pathogen that's there. It's gonna jump into the lymph and it's gonna go to the lymph node to activate um, T cells. Dendritic cells are they themselves activated by TNF and pattern recognition receptors like TLR, which you'll don't stress about, we'll learn about in its own chapter later on. Um, okay, the macrophages, these are sentinels I mentioned earlier, they're activated by interferon. They can also be activated by pattern recognition receptors like TLR to get the immune system going. They can also re-stimulate T cells at the site of infection. They can start in this positive feedback loop um, as many components of the immune system can um, that will continue until the pathogen is cleared. Okay. So what about B cells? So B cell um, can take a pathogen, it binds to the antigen by the B cell receptor so then the B cell receptor and the antigen gets engulfed. Um, cell will then package the antigen 
on the MHC class two. It holds it up on its cell surface. It presents to T cells. B cells can be very efficient presenters. Um, eh, okay, don't want to overcomplicate things. Um, there is one non-classical MHC um, to be aware of. It's called CD1. It's an MHC class one-like molecule. It's paired with a B2, beta-2 microglobulin like MHC class one is, um, but it binds lipids and it's, it's, it, it's unique because it binds lipids. It presents to T cells or a special type of NKT cells um, that kind of bridge the innate and the adaptive immune system. Don't need to know much about that now. Now we're at the T cells. Okay. So T cell receptors, there's two different types. There's an alpha beta T cell receptor and there's a gamma delta T cell receptor. Alpha beta is T cells, the vast majority of T cells in your body. 95% are alpha beta T cells. They have a CD4 or CD8 co-receptor. They recognize the MHC plus the peptide um, and they are educated in the thymus. T cells aren't T cells without the thymus. They have to go through this education system in the thymus before they can even be T cells. Gamma delta C T, T cells do not have co-receptors. They're found in the intestine, the uterus, the tongue. There's much less known about them than the alpha beta T cells. They undergo some rearrangement, but it's much less diverse. And they recognize something called um, McA and McB, which is expressed on stressed cells. NK T cells um, also mature in the thymus. They also have alpha beta receptors and they recognize lipids presented on that non-classical MHC that I just mentioned called CD1. Um, they are about 1% of circulating T cells, also not very well understood compared to our classic alpha beta T cells. Okay, so how does T cell receptor signaling work? There are alpha beta chains that are extracellular, and then there is a CD3 for the intracellular signaling. You have um, a gamma de um, delta gamma, two epsilon, and two zeta chains um, make up the CD3 molecule. It can signal for activation, energy, or death. So as you're starting to hear, um, and then probably what the biggest takeaway is for today, when two cells get in close approximation and they want to signal to each other, it's not just one receptor that binds to another receptor. There's a whole bunch of interactions that happen in what we call a synapse. So if you think of instead of two cells meeting like this, it actually kind of flattens and you get a whole bunch of interactions. And that's what all these little components are. So here on the right in this picture, you see the antigen presenting cell with this MHC class two, you see the antigen being held up, and then you see your T cell with your T cell receptor. You have a CD4 co-receptor in this case. If it's a CD4 co-receptor, you know it's an MHC class two. If it's a CD8 co-receptor, that only binds to MHC class one. Um, but this is needed because it strengthens for adhesion and it strengthens the signal. So remember, you want checks and balances. You don't want your T cells to run amok or go out of control. This is one of those checks and balances. This is, gives a nice stable adhesion as part of the synapse that's um, starting to form. But then you need this co-stimulator that will amplify the signal, just like we saw on B cells and this T cell signal you get a CD28 to B7 interaction, and that's the co-stimulator. That's required for activation of a naive T cell. Okay, so here is the whole kind of T cell synapse that you can see. You have your MHC class two, you have your alpha and beta chains. MHC class two, alpha and beta chains, is gonna recognize the antigen that MHC class two is holding up. You get this stable co-receptor here with the CD4, um, and then you have this co-stimulator, the B7 to CD28. And then remember the alpha beta T cell receptor itself doesn't go through to the cytoplasm. That's why you have these CD3, these um, 
gamma delta, two epsilon, and then you have two zeta chains. And these components are all going to actually start that cascade of proteins that go down to the nucleus. And in this case, and start of, instead of starting to signal and make more antibody, it's going to signal and make more cytokines. So the cytokines are the most important um, function of the T cells. And we actually label different T cells by the types of cytokines they secrete. They're otherwise the same. They're very easy, a TH17 cell is one a T cell that is actually secreting IL-17. TH2 cells, which of course we will talk about all the time during your fellowship, secrete IL-4, IL-5, IL-13. Oops, these are the um, atopic cytokines, uh, IL-4, IL-13, of course, are targeted by things like dupixent. IL-5 is something that's targeted by um, Nucala and Senra, and there's a new drug coming out. Um, it's actually several IL-5s out. There's a new one that was just published last week in the New England Journal of Medicine. That's an every six-month injection that is targeted IL-5, and apparently even stronger than either Nucala or Fosenra. T regulatory cells are for T cell that instead of increase in inflammation and in general decrease inflammation, they keep everything regulated and quiet. The cytokines um, that make up a T regulatory cell are TGF beta and IL-10. I would start to connect those cytokines as ones of regulating, of downregulation, of calm, not inflammation. And then there's TH1 associated with IL-2, but interferon gamma is probably the most important of the TH1 profile and IL-12 as well. Okay, so what all these different cytokines do, IL-2 is in CD4 cells, often the first cytokine secreted because it simulates growth and the differentiation and survival of CD8 positive T cells. Interferon, uh, we already heard, primes macrophages and causes B cells to switch to uh, IgG3. IL-12 is secreted by macrophages and it causes T cells to switch to type 1. IL-4 is a growth factor for B cells and it causes B cells switching to IgE. IL-5 causes B cells switching to IgA, but it also stimulates eosinophils, which is why we were looking for that eosinophil asthma before we prescribed IL-5. And then IL-10 and TGF-beta are down regulators. Okay, so you have dendritic cells that will sense invaders via these pattern recognition receptors. These are patterns that are specific to pathogens. They're not on human cells. The dendritic cell will then decide based on the pattern it saw if this is more likely a helminthic parasite or if this is more likely something like strep or staph. And it will start secreting cytokines that will then influence the decision of the T cell to adopt a certain cytokine profile. So an allergy, what we spend a lot of our research on is figuring out why the dendritic cell is signaling to T cells to become a TH2 cell instead of a different type of cell, whether it be a T regulatory cell or a T cell, why that skewing is happening. And those cytokines that get secreted by both the T cell, because the dendritic cells are short-lived, but also like macrophages and the other cells that are sitting in the um, inflammatory environment, that's what's going to um, influence that battle, that, that pathogen battle with our immune systems. Okay, I think we're almost at the end. <clears throat> CD8 um, killer T cells, they deliver perforin and granzyme, and it's a signal for a cell to die off. It's a kill signal. It initiates apoptosis by something called the fast fast ligand system, which you'll hear more about later. Quick run through our lymphoid organs. Our lymphoid organs, our primary lymphoid organs, of course, are what creates our cells. So that's the bone marrow and the thymus. And then our secondary lymphoid organs are where our inflammatory <coughs> response is occurring. That's the lymph nodes, the spleen, and then there's something called the mold, the mucosal, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue in the GI tract. There are lymphoid follicles, follicles that are on all of the secondary lymphoid organs. Um, there are primary follicles and secondary um, follicles. The primary follicles, uh, sorry. 
I'm totally messing this up. Okay. The lymphoid follicles are in the secondary lymphoid organs. And there are um, zones where different things are going to happen within these lymphoid organs. Okay, so in the primary zone, you're going to get um, something called follicular dendritic cells, um, which are different than dendritic cells. So don't confuse the two. It's a follicular dendritic cell and a dendritic cell. It's very um, confusing, in my opinion. And this is where your B cells are going to be. But then you can have, they get activated into a secondary. And this is where you get actually a dark zone. And this is where somatic hypermutation and class switching occurs once a B cell has been activated. All right, I'm going to kind of run through this super quickly now. I think I have a patient um, that I have to see. Um, okay, so cells are all the time running into our lymph nodes in and out. Uh, they go from the lymph into the um, marginal sinus. There's the cortex where the B cell zone is, the paracortex where the T cell zone is, and then a medullary sinus, and then a doorway of the artery, the arterial, and then the high endothelial venule. This is the doorway back into the blood. So this is where there starts to be. The B cells can actually go um, and circulate from the lymph into the bloodstream and then back again as we can do drug cells or T cells. Um, there's an exit from the lymph node. Um, for the lymph, it's the medullary sinus, but into the blood, it's the venules and veins back into the bloodstream. Um, I mean, this is a picture of the entire complex in and out, but I'm going to zip through it in the interest of time. Payer's patches um, are found in the intestine. They're an example of that mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. Um, it does, includes um, high endothelial venules and outgoing lymph, but it does not include incoming lymph. So antigens are engulfed in endosomes in the M cells and then passed through into these patches. Here is a specialized M cell in your GI tract. And here is your payer's patch that goes in the secondary lymphoid organ, the mucosal associated lymphoid organ. All right, I'm going to just actually go through very quickly. I think we have to zip through this. Sorry, it was too much. I bit off too much. 